Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Going to start another new book today of the Minor Prophets. This will be uh, the last uh, of the minor, uh, the, of the group of seven before the captivity, all right? And uh, the name of the book is Nahum. And Nahum in the Hebrew tongue means compassionate. Uh, it can mean uh, counselor. Um, I like to put them together and call it compassionate counselor. Nahum uh, is the name of a city, the city of Nahum, which is Capernaum, uh, as it is listed in the New Testament in the Greek. Capernaum, Jesus himself would spend a lot of time there because he was, as far as I'm concerned, the compassionate counselor. So um, having said that, um, Jonah went to Nineveh and they repented. The city of Nineveh repented. But it didn't last long, so what's new under the sun? So Nahum, his subject again, will be Nineveh, just before the captivity. And of course, Nineveh, the Assyrian will still take the ten northern tribes captive, and they will move north. The year would be about 603, with the 110-year correction of the... Um, uh, kings, as you will find in your appendix in the Companion Bible. Having said that, uh, chapter 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, and it reads, The burden of Nineveh, back to that city, the book of the vision of Nahum, that's compassionate, the Elkoshite. Um, now, the interesting thing about um, uh, Elkhamus, uh, which uh, where this El, El um, Kushite's from, it is about. It's on the east bank. Or it was on the east bank of the Tigris River, and it's two miles north of Mosul. Do you know what happened at Mosul just a couple of weeks ago? Uh, the two sons of Saddam Hussein were taken there, and they went on to the happy hunting grounds. So, uh, actually, the geographical location we're speaking of could be right where the house was, okay? So, it's amazing how uh, types, as we observe history in the old country of Assyria and Babylon, uh, give us types and signs as God promised they would. As chapter 4 said, in the last days, so you want to stay awake and keep informed from your Father's Word. The minor prophets are like reading tomorrow's newspaper. Pay real good attention. Verse 2, the emotions of God, we might say. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, two times for emphasis, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now, some people would just start shaking in their boots. Well, uh, did you read it properly? Surely you're not an enemy of God. Well, no, of course not. Well, then it doesn't apply to you. That's not what it's talking about. God has the ability through the Holy Spirit to take care of his own wherever they are. If you're in the very center of tribulation, just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the center of the fiery furnace, seven times hotter than necessary, the Son of God walked with them. Their hair was not singed, nor was their clothes, their clothing. So therefore, God is only angry at his enemies. So, but he's angry, and he is jealous. When you start worshiping other gods, especially in the futurist sense, the spurious Messiah, you're in trouble, friend. Or when you, start, when you begin changing God's laws to fit your church or your being, you're headed down a slippery slope. And it's going to be a rough bump at the bottom, friend. 
because God is jealous, He's angry, He's full of wrath, and He will. It's His promise emphasized three times in that one verse, He will take vengeance. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. Boy, it takes a long time. And great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. It's not going to happen. The wicked are going to get it. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. God controls nature. Why? He created it. He can cause to happen. This is not to say you're to blame God for everything that happens, but when he gets ready to release his wrath, where do you think uh, the hailstones prophesied of in the 38th, 39th chapter of Ezekiel and in the uh, 18th and 19th chapters of the great book of Revelation? Where do you think they come from? God arranges it. Okay? And they weigh a talent. That's anywhere from about 110 to about 180 pounds each. Have you ever seen a hailstorm where they were as big as your fist? It'll, it'll kill cattle. Well, these, these babies are going to weigh 100 pounds or more. I would never overlook the fact of any time whirlwind is used. This is what uh, the name of the highly polished bronze vehicles mentioned in the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew manuscripts, the color amber is in the Hebrew tongue highly polished bronze. So there was absolutely a vehicle there. And the horses of the Bible are mentioned many times and people read over. God controls. Verse 4, He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry. He, and drieth up the rivers. Bashan languisheth. Uh, and Bashan is just really a fertile place. I mean, they never want for water or, or nice crops. And Carmel, Carmel means a, a, um, a, a pleasant place, paradise uh, even. Okay? And the flower of Lebanon languisheth. When God is ready, he'll wilt it. He'll control it. Vengeance belongeth to him. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt. Mountains can be um, uh, nations and hills cities, okay? Many times that is utilized, as you well noticed. And the earth is burned at his presence. God is a consuming fire. But I hope you understand the difference between hellfire and God the consuming fire. The presence of the Holy Spirit burns and warms in the heart of those that love him and, and blots out those that do not. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. And of course, as you well know, and as it is written in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that staunchy on in the Greek that the rudiments will melt. Do you know what that is? That's everything that is wicked or evil, not, not the good. God doesn't intend destroy, to destroy this earth that is the good things of it, but the evil, the wicked, and that that offends will melt with fervent heat. God is a consuming fire. Documentation, last verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to continue. Who can stand before his indignation, before his anger? You can. And who can abide in the furiousness of his anger? You can. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. But that fire to you is the Holy Spirit that warms your heart, that gives you that wonderful feeling of the presence of God. But it is rough on that that is wicked, and God knows what people think even. That's why he's the judge and we're not. You can make that stand. You do not have to, you know the word always in the Old Testament and the New, usually that is used, fear God, it's, it's a double 
a meaning word in the Hebrew, uh, meaning to revere or to fear. To revere means to love, and that's the beginning of the knowledge from Almighty God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. That's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, is to love God, to reverence Him. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. That's where you go, friend. You got it? Even though he's angry, even though he's full of wrath, he is your stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. He doesn't have to play guessing games. He knows if you trust him to take care of you when you are doing his work. The world will hate you. If you're expecting a, a, a bed of roses, you are sadly mistaken. Many people will pray and say, Oh, if I could be just like Jesus in his teaching and as he walked, the love and the peace. Hey, they, they crucified him. They, they tried to stone him. They hated him in many cases. When you teach truth, you better get set for some kind of rough sailing occasionally, but go into the stronghold that protects you, that always uh, takes revenge on even those that would offend you, as he has said in many places, touch not mine anointed, or touch not those that have the seal of God in their forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. Use it. If you have absorbed in your mind this letter that God has written to you with the assurances of that last verse, I will be a stronghold. That means a fortress. That means a place that you can go in the day of trouble. You can go there and he will always embrace you in that Holy Spirit that is that fire to the wicked, but the warming to your heart. Know him well. Let it be your strength. Trust him. You know, uh, you can kind of tell and test people's faith by their trust in him. If God makes a promise in his word that he will do this or that, then, hey, it is done. God said it. It's written. That's the end of it. Don't be a worry wart. He said it. That's it. Verse 8. I, I, want, I, I really feel I should add one thing onto that. It's important that you remember that um, it, it stated here, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. There are times he's going to wait till the right moment. Unfortunately, sometimes human beings, when they're offended a little bit, they want God to strike instantly. He doesn't work that way. He'll wait until the time is right so that when he pulls the chair up from under them, they have a long fall. Okay, so don't don't try to lead God. It's all right to talk to him, all right to ask him, but don't try to push him. That is not wise. Okay, now continuing with the next verse, verse eight. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies, and uh, that's the way it will be. I mean, at that moment, God will, uh, you know, like an overflowing of the Nile, it takes away everything in front of it. In other words, God is all-powerful. Verse 9, what do you imagine against the Lord? Uh, what, what, what do you think you can dream up against him? He will make an utter end Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Do you know what this says in the Hebrew? Let's, let's just simplify it a little bit. It says, who is thinking that they can defeat God or argue with him? Because he's going to issue one blow and there won't be need for a second. That's pretty final, my friend. No second time. Not needed. All done. Our Father is very quick, effective, and efficient to accomplish what it is He wishes to accomplish. Verse 10, 
For while they be folded together as thorns, they remember in the last book they weave this little basket of thorns together. The the preachers, the priests, uh, the um, leaders in political offices, they weave this little basket and they want a bribe here and a bribe there and rip you off here and rip you off there. Uh, do something holy and pass, pass the hat every, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, and, and, and their little old basket is going to be all woven together of thorns, but God's going to take it apart. You leave it alone. Incidentally, thorns make, they don't burn long, but boy, do they make a hot fire. And while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. God's wrath will end it. And that old basket will be gone in one minute. The, the four hidden dynasties that we will cover in detail when we get to the book of Zechariah in these minor prophets in chapter 1, we'll find out. Verse 11, There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Now, you will have a type here in this book of this wicked counselor, but in the futurist sense, that wicked counselor is not Nahum the wise counselor, which is ultimately would be Christ. It's the false Christ, the wrong advisor. As it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, our gathering back to Christ, don't let my first letter that most people take the rapture doctrine from in chapter 4 deceive you about our gathering back to Christ. It is not going to happen until after the wicked counselor, which is being translated in Greek there, the, uh, the uh, son of perdition, and this becomes rather complicated. Well, who's the son of perdition? There's only one. You don't have any guesses. Well, what does that mean? It means that God, aside from the white throne judgment, has judged no one to hell yet except Satan. So there's only one son, and Satan is a son of God. God created him. And he is already condemned to death to be turned to ashes from within by the consuming fire. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 19, 18 and 19. He's already sentenced to death, but he still lives because he's got work to do as the wicked counselor in the futurist sense. We'll have a type of him before we finish the book. You'll learn from him. 12. Thus saith the Lord... Though they be quiet, that's to say, though they think they're secure, they got it made, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Now, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I, I'm going to just say in passing, I'm going to leave this stand, but this is a statement written to Judah. And verse 12 actually belongs after verse 15 because you have a, a um, subject change in that verse. But that's all right. Leave it there. But when I read 15, I will read this verse again so that you have clarity. It, it, it's no big deal. Don't make a big deal out of it. Dr. Moffat, this is one of the very good works that he did is to organize and put in order the manuscripts and the translation thereof. Uh, your companion Bible will have quite a comment about this verse. Continuing verse 13, do not let that digress your mind. 13, for now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bounds in sunder. The, how does he do that today? The truth. What does the truth do? The truth sets you free. Don't you ever listen to some man that takes God's word and puts you in bondage because the truth and Almighty God set you free. You have a ship. It's yours. You sail it. And if you put it on the rocks, guess whose fault it is? Yours. You listen to God's word. It's good to listen to a good teacher, but check him out in the word of God. For our Father is, is our Father, and it is He that you really want to listen to. He will guide you, 
man sometimes may disappoint you, God will never let you down. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Don't forget it. Verse 14, And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy uh, that no more of thy name be shown sown rather out of the house of thy gods. This would be uh, 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 the end of Nineveh, the Assyrian. Will I cut off the graven image and the molten image? I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. And of course, this goes back to the wicked counselor. He is the only entity. Now, that is named. Now, let me hasten to add, there are 7,000 Nephilim, which is to say from the Hebrew prime, Napha, fallen, fallen angels, that are condemned to death, that left their place of habitation as it is written in the first six verses of the great book of Jude. But they're not named. Only one named is the vile counselor, that is to say, the son of perdition, and his grave, he's the only one that his grave is already prepared. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. Verse 15. Behold, up on the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, uh, that publisheth peace, O Judah. And Judah comes into line here, okay? Keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows. For the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Now let's go back and let's reread verse 12 again and let you make your own mind up. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, secure, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut off when he shall pass through. I will have afflicted thee. I will afflict thee no more. Okay. No more, meaning nothing's going to happen to God's children again. He's going to take care of them, all right? No more. He's, again, the last verse, uh, a sentence of verse 15, he is utterly cut off. So, in chapter 2, we kind of get into the destruction of Nineveh. You know, our father utilizes and has down through history the Assyrian, which is Nineveh being the capital thereof, the Assyrian, as you will find in Isaiah chapter 14, is one of the names utilized as a type of the Antichrist. You with companion Bibles, it's all laid out for you. You're the homework done for you. Uh, this is the same chapter, Isaiah 14, where God would speak directly to the bright morning star, the fake Lucifer, which in the Hebrew tongue means that bright morning star, the fake, and say they will look into the pit and say, is this the man that deceived the world, meaning by his wicked counsel? Well, you bet it is. And then it continues on about Satan and his downfall in the pit. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. Verse 2, for the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob, that's all 12 tribes, as the excellency of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Um, well, how did they do that? Well, the Assyrian took the ten tribes and took them north over the Caucasus Mountains. They were later named Caucasians because of that, and they scattered all over Europe by the millions and later even to this great nation. So God promised they would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they? But, uh, well, I, I don't know. Well, yes, you do. If you believe God's word, that was his promise, and it has come true. That's why this great nation is the superpower of superpowers. 
That's why when you pull a coin out of your pocket, it says, in God we trust. That's why our great uh, constitution is taken from this word of God, the God's law that we now abide by, supposedly. He says, I've emptied them out. They don't even know who they are. I haven't forgotten them. I know who they are. Who is the main branch? Is God and the vine, and who is, uh, and who is the pruner, rather? Christ is the vine, we're the branches, and God does the pruning. Stand by. Verse 3, the shield of his mighty men is made red. Red with what? Well, you don't need any guesses. The valiant men, valiant men are in scarlet. The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. Hey, when God does the battle, everything shakes, friend. There's a great shaking. You take in Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 18, where he says, My people are just a little bit sottish, meaning a little bit stupid and slow to think. He said, if you don't think I destroyed this earth age once before, look at how I did not leave one man, one city. I left nothing in the first overthrow. There's going to be, as it is written, and it comes to my mind real quickly in the 12th chapter of the great book of Hebrews, he said, one more time, not only the earth, but heaven also shall be shaken. And there's only one rock that you can stand on whereby you can withstand God's uh, um, uh, wrath, and that is the, the rock of Christ, uh, to be in him, with him. For he is not angry at his own, but he is angry at those that twist his word, that try to change his word, that do not adhere to his word, do not live his word. Verse 4. The chariot shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. Um, and they shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. Um, they're going to shake and run, and boy, what a time. Again, do you have to worry? No. And do you have God's armor on? I mean, we're talking about a war here. You better have it on. Let me ask you a question. When you have the armor of God on, what protects you? You have a shield? That shield does protect you. That's Christ. Do you have a belt on to hold your britches up? You don't want to lose them. Do you know what the belt is of the gospel armor? It's the Word of God. You either have it on in your mind or you'll be losing things. It's going to be quite a war for some, but for us it is a war of victory. Verse 5, He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. The king is going to try to gather everything together here. They shall make haste in the wall to the wall thereof and the defense shall be prepared. Verse 6, the gates of the rivers shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. God has a way. He, it's a flood he's talking about. What, what, what chance do you think a little old gate has against a flood? It dissolves it, all right. It dissipates it. It takes care of business. 7, and Huzab, shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maid shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabbering upon their breast. Do you know, do you know who this uh, Hazab is? She's the, um, she is the queen. She is um, the queen of Assyria, and she is likened to the queen of Babylon. Multi-breasted, ooh, fertility, on and on and on. She is so sweet, but her lies are sufficient to mislead thousands of people if they listen to her. She shall be 
led away captive. There will be no false teaching. You might think of her uh, tabbering upon their breast. You might think of her as that one that would say in Revelation, what is it, 16, I'm not a widow. I'm married. She was the queen of Babylon. She was that harlot Babylon. Babel meaning confusion and people that that people that rest or attempt to rest in confusion rather than getting into the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, find themselves in her bed. It's all right. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. No, you're not. And why would... Who could possibly pass God off as being that stupid that he would name a book, Revelation, which I don't care what language you translate it in, it means to unveil or to reveal, meaning to make known, whereby you would know how in the end times the number goes down. As he had, would say in 13 Mark, I have foretold you all things. Have you read it? Don't follow the old queen of heaven, so to speak. Verse 8, But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. They are going to haul, they're going to take the old H-A, uh, they're going to take the old haul out route, okay? They're going to be gone. That's, that's a military term, and I probably shouldn't have used it, but I did. They're gone. They give up quick. Verse 9, Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. Vessels of desire. You know, which is more important, God's children and their welfare or riches of the world? Which is more important in your heart? Is assisting those that are so unlearned in our Father's Word or being wealthy, having the so-called desires of the world? You know, in a, in a sense, I can tell you, you don't have to, I, I don't want it to be a worrying point to you because those that truly do God's work will be wealthy. You can't miss. Why? God says, I know what you have need of, and if you do my work, I'm going to take care of you, and he always does. You know, there is one thing many people forget, though. You have to do the work. He furnishes the brick. You can build anything you want, and he'll furnish the brick if you're honest, but you got to do the work. That proves you worthy, all right? So be sure you're not deceived. As we see old Nineveh going down, even after Jonah saved it through the preaching because they worshiped a fish god and here this fish burps him out on dry land and they think, here's our savior. And it sure disturbed old Jonah. Well, Nahum, is telling us how it would end. It didn't last long. They slipped right back into their old thing with the little queen of heaven. All right, hey, don't miss the next lecture and uh, the book of Nahum, the wise counselor, our father and his son. Don't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?